to The Mary Mack Show, where we will be talking about your feelings, experiences, and pain following the death of a loved one. two of our conversation with Rebecca Brown, we now talk about Cole's death as well as all the details surrounding the case, as well as her advocacy work with Drug-Induced Homicide Foundation.org, their Oklahoma chapter, and Families Supporting Families, which helps individuals who have experienced the murder of their children by fentanyl poisoning. Please, please remember to subscribe, rate, review, and comment. It really helps us to increase our status in the algorithms, and this gives us an opportunity to be in front of many more people who need to hear these words. They need to know what this is all about. It's so imperative that you do that for us. Thank you so much. Enjoy this episode, and we will speak to you again soon this group and the friendships I made and just the support from them, it saved me. And I think it was like the second or third dinner. And I told Diane, I said, okay, I need a job. Um, I had moved to Oklahoma, like I said, and I, and I wasn't working. So, um, she's like, okay, so we make posters, um, for loved ones that for, for people who've lost their loved ones. And we take them to rallies at the time they did two or three rallies out here. So I started making these posters for these rallies and they're, they're big, they're like 20 by 30 and they say their picture. And I'm, I mean, their, their, their name and their forever age and what they passed from. And, you know, I started doing that and then it just kind of started like a ripple effect. I got into doing that. Me and Diane got to be, you know, really good friends. And I was like, okay, um, I want to do more, you know, um, like I said, I had researched a lot, so I had a not lot of knowledge. I went to, um, a forum they put on in Broken Arrow out here, which is another town. And I got interviewed and I was like, oh my gosh, I don't even know what I'm going to say, you know, but (laughs) the more I talked about it, the more I healed from sharing about it. Um, and I became very adamant. Like I want people to know about this. I feel like education, education of our youth of our children is at the utmost important because I feel like Cole deserved that he should have known about it. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I truly felt in my heart, like, why wasn't he taught about this? You know what I mean? Like, why did we not know? So, um, with our group families, party families, I actually went to California. I was able to speak at Cole's high school, um, with the one pill kills with Laura Didier and mm-hmm. um, the Placer County DA out there and a few other moms. And we did three assemblies. And not only was Michael, I was looking forward to that because a lot of them knew Cole. They were his friends. They were seniors. Um, I wanted them to hear his story. And I wanted them, you know, when you, when you know somebody, you're so much more touched by their story and what happened to them, you know, mm-hmm. um, So I wanted to do that, but my goal was to, to learn what they did so we could come back here in Oklahoma and implement it into the schools out here. So that's exactly what we did do. And, um, we started doing assemblies out here. So last year, I believe we did 20 assemblies in Oklahoma and we did, um, I want to say like four church forums and several community events. Plus we had our, our rallies that we did with our group out here. So, you know, um, yeah, that's kind of been my, my go-to it's been my purpose, I guess, you know, I, I wasn't able to save my son, but gosh, darn it. I'm going to share and talk and tell everybody about it. So in hopes it doesn't happen to their family. Because I would never, and I know there's probably many parents never want anybody to be in our shoes, 
you know. No. Um, That's so. kind of why you do this. You know? Absolutely. And you know what? You may never know who you saved. And that's okay. Yep. Says. And, you know, it does get frustrating because you go and share and then you hear about another person or another teen that died. And it's like, gosh, why am I, what am I doing here? You know, like, but then my husband's like, babe, you don't, you're don't. you not going to be able to save everybody. But even if you just save one person, you know, and some of the stories you get back, you know, like we, we were talking earlier about the kids, you know, when I share Cole's story, a lot of them are dealing with mental health issues. A lot of them are dealing with the loss of a parent, you know, um, cold, you know, I think he did a lot for entertainment of trying different drugs and the excitement and seeing what they do, like all kids experiment. But I also think some of it was to stuff feelings. Cause when you're doing those drugs, you don't feel anything, That's you know, right. trying to medicate. Um, I will never truly know what Cole did. Cause I couldn't read his mind, you know, and kids aren't big on sharing why they do what they do. Um, but I can tell you like, just from what the kids tell me and they come down and they just, I mean, I've been told all kinds of things. So, you know, maybe it's just opening doors for these kids to have someone to share, share with what they're dealing with in their life, you know? So Michael, I mean, I always say he was not defined by what took his life. He might've died to a laced pill of fentanyl, but he, there was so much more to him than that. Without a doubt. And his legacy continues. Absolutely. Now, did the police in California ever find anyone or bring it to justice? Um, I will be very honest. The, the local police were not, the detectives were not. Okay. Let me start over on this. I had to track down Cole's um, toxicology report. It had sat there for a month. Nobody had contacted me. I didn't want to bug them. So about, they told me three, about three and a half months I called and I was able, first of all, they couldn't find it. And I said, well, I can tell you he passed, so it should be there. And you could, I mean, the anxiety I felt when they said they couldn't find it. I was like, are you kidding me? Yeah, really. Um, But um, they were able to locate it. And then I contacted the county he passed in, which was Placer County. And I got the detective that had written the, the report at the hotel. I was able to locate him. And then he sent me to a detective that would work on my son's case. Um, I don't want to talk bad. And you never know what, if it's lack of experience for the detectives or lack of time or money or overload. I don't know. But it was a fight. I had to literally fight for everything. Um, They had Cole's phone. So I asked for them to get into that. They were able to send that off and get that um, opened. It took two weeks to get his phone broke. They took it. We didn't know the code. Um, Cole changed it because he didn't want his nosy mom in the phone. (laughs) um, Changed his code? Yes. And I knew he had. But he was not going to give it to me. So after he passed, they sent it off. And the detective was like, it could take months. It took two weeks. And they they were able to unlock his phone and look into it. Keep in mind, though, this was already four months in after Cole passed. And nobody had been before that um, questioned. The phone wasn't looked at because they couldn't get into it. I wasn't even asked if they if I had the code. But, you know, there was a lot of in my mind, mishandlings now looking back on Cole's case. I mean, we called immediately two days after I had my dad call and ask if they would pursue the case as a homicide. And we were told that we had to wait for the toxicology report to come back. Well, that is no longer sufficient anymore because in three months you lose all kinds of data from Snapchat. You lose all kinds of stuff off the phone, video surveillance, Cole had mapped out on his phone where he went that afternoon, the, the first before he passed away. Um, he literally put it in play. Like you could see the addresses he had been to. Um, the detective, the local detective had said, well, we don't go to addresses. I said, what? <laughs> um, okay. They said, we haven't been successful with that. And I, there was actually one address and a kid he had been texting with 
and I say a kid, I don't know how old he was, you know, I'm assumed a person, I guess I should say. And, um, anyways, I can't go into a huge amount of detail, but there was a red light ticket Cole got two days after he passed. We got it in the mail. He had done a Hollywood stop to turn right in California where he didn't stop all the way and just went through the red. Well, there was a passenger with him and it was just so happened. It was on the first that afternoon before he passed. So the detective, the local detective was able to uncover the face, locate who he was with. And then that was kind of where it sat. Um, They weren't able to find out who he was, but they could see the face. We didn't know who he was. He just wasn't able. So there was this address from a kid he was, he had texted with um, that he had met on Snapchat. There was a Snapchat mat. Uh, from this particular person on Cole's phone. And um, anyways, he was able, one of the addresses was there on this phone. So I asked the detective, well, can't you go to that? At this time I had with the detective asked for his superior to be on the conversation because everything we did keep in mind was over a phone since we didn't live in California. So um, I had said, well, or I, I had asked him to go to this particular address um of this kid he was with the day before he had passed that afternoon and they said we don't go to them and I said well so and then then I kind of broke down and started bawling I'm gonna be honest just overwhelmed by like this is out of my hands it's out of my control I have to trust you to do this and you're not going to do this if this was your kid would you have done it I'm sure you would have so I expect it to be done for my son I said are you going to tell a mother that she has to go her whole life wondering if you went to this address, you may find out who sold this to my son and took his life. So after my little crying session, the, um, the superior of the detective says, okay, we'll go to this address, but this is the last thing we're going to do. I said, okay, great, cool. Go to the address. Even though there was other addresses he had been to, but you know, so they went and guess who they located the person in the red light ticket, or that was in that red light ticket with him. Now, to this day, um, after this incident with this detective, um, like I said, I'm just gonna say it as, if it would have been his kid, there would have been a lot more done. And I can guarantee that. Mm -hmm. But like, it's, it's out of my hands. I have to entrust that into that detective. So I was unhappy with what he had done Out here in Oklahoma, I did uh, community forums where we would go and sit on a panel and there would be a DEA agent, a doctor, um, a mom. And I was at one of these where one of these DEA agents out here in Oklahoma came up to me and he's like, Rebecca, what's going on with your son's case? And I said, well, you know, he passed in California. So knowing out here is going to do no good, you know? And he's like, well, I, I would love to see what you have. So I am one of those people. Yeah, I was, it was unexpected. You know, I wasn't asking, he asked me. So I met up with him and another one of his agents here in Oklahoma, we sat down and I have been, I'm that kind of person that writes everything down. So from the beginning of work, like getting Cole's toxicology, I I have a notebook that I've written every conversation, every detail that I, I'm, I'm just that my brain works that way. And I thought it might be important somewhere down the line, you know? Right. So right. I did that and I sat down, showed him his phone, showed him what was on his phone, who he had talked to, the Snapchat maps, or menus, I guess they're not maps, but menus that, you know, on Snapchat, though, drug dealers were trying to sell drugs to Cole and he had screenshotted them and they were on his phone. Wow. So after looking at all the evidence, he says, I think there's more to this. So um, he ended up, sending a message to agents in Sacramento County that he had known and asked them to pick up the case. So that went on for about a month and we hadn't heard back from anybody. So I decided I'm kind of a squeaky will. <laughs> I don't yes, just, I understand. Right. I've been there myself. <laughs> so I decided I was going to write a letter. So I did. I wrote a letter to um, the San Francisco DEA agency, which is the head of uh, Northern California. I wrote a letter to the Sacramento County DEA agency. And I also wrote a letter to the attorney general's office. And I explained to them who my son was, what his plans were in life, 
how it was stolen. It was a page and a little little bit on the second and how there was mishandlings. And I wanted the case to be relooked at by fresh eyes and be worked as if it was their own child, because that's how it should be. So I sent those off and I'll tell you, I made probably 40 copies of each letter. Plus I sent a picture of Cole, which was a picture we had taken of him um, in July after he had graduated, like a graduation picture. So it wasn't even, but like a month and a half later that Cole had passed. So I sent that picture and explained that. And within three weeks, I got a phone call from the letter that went to the attorney general in California. Um, he sent it to the Department of Justice, and I have a detective working on his case right now with the Department of Justice. Wow. So he has, yeah, he has, I mean, there's definitely no, no guarantee, but this guy, there's no perfect detective out there, but I'm going to tell you, and I didn't even say this to him, but he said, I have children of my own. And I try to treat every case as if it was my child. And as soon as he said that, I was like, you're the one that's supposed to do this. Whether, And I've always said from the beginning, whether they find the person or not, they're going to be held accountable someday right. for what they did to my son. But as long as the detective is doing, finding the answers, doing the work, doing what they should be. You know, that is all I can expect. You know right. what I mean? Yes. So this guy is still actively working Cole's case. There has been a few hiccups, you know, that have really shocked me, honestly. Uh, not with him, but I'll, I'll just share it. So, well, should I share it? There's been some issues with Cole's, um, with the, um, when they did the first, when they took all of the evidence out of the room. Yes. Somehow that evidence has been destroyed. Oh, I don't. How lovely. Yeah, let me tell you this. It was destroyed not even a year after my son passed away, which I'm not happy about. But I'm getting ready to contact that county to find out why. Because I want that to happen to somebody else. That should not have happened. Exactly. It doesn't mean that the case is done. It just means it was a little bit of a hiccup. So, you know, um, I've learned all these cases because I read a lot about other cases and listen to what other parents say, especially on the drug induced homicide and man, there's no rhyme to reason on these cases. You never know what's going to happen. You never know what kind of a detective, what they're willing to do, you know, but I can honestly say, keep pushing and keep writing and keep talking and the squeaky wheel gets the grease. You know, I am, I feel like this detective is working the case how it should have been from the beginning, you know? So I know in my heart, I can't, if my son had been here, I would fight to him, fight for him no matter what. And that doesn't change that he's not here on earth. I'm still going to fight for my son yeah. until I can't any longer. And one of the quotes I like the best is, um, it's the dead cannot cry out for justice. It's up to the living to do so for them. Absolutely. And I think every parent, don't give up, keep fighting. It might end up nowhere at the end of the day, but you know, I mean, you have to be able to live with it. You know what I mean? So yes. I wouldn't have been able to live with it unless I had done everything I knew to do. Yes, definitely. Because then you so, have no, no regrets whatsoever. You, you brought it through the, to the distance it needed to go and you kept pushing. And I totally agree. I mean, in our case, it was 18 years and it wasn't until the lead detective retired and two new detectives were put on the case. And within a month, they had it all lined up. See, and you just can't give up that hope. No. You know, I said there will come a point where if they tell me there's nothing more at this time. Okay. But you know, what? at that time, I'm going to put it in God's hands because, yeah, you know, we don't know what's meant to happen here. You know what I mean? You just don't know. But yes. I always say they're going to find a much harsher punishment if they don't get it handled here than if they go, <laughs> yes. you know, so. yes. and maybe twice as much. Right. Yeah. And I'm not saying I'm out for revenge. I'm just out for, for justice. You know, um, I'm sure you understand it becomes very, these, um, it takes over your mind. Like it does like your thoughts, like all for a while there, all I could think about is 
think I was waking up in the middle of the night. I was thinking about what about this? Did I tell him about this? Did I write this down? You know what I mean? Yes, it, yes. I became very consumed with it. Yes. Um, I kind of take a step back and be like, okay, I can't let it consume my life, but I am definitely going to do what I can. So, yes. yeah. and as far as, as far as, uh, vengeance <laughs> or revenge or whatever, uh, one of my favorite lines, scriptures in the Bible, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. Absolutely. And anyone who hurts me in any manner, I speak that out loud. I'm like, Lord, I'm just reminding you. <laughs> oh, I, I, I 100% agree at that, you know. So. And then I can let it be, you know, no matter how difficult whatever comes against us, right? Absolutely. And I know Cole's probably up there. First of all, I'll be like, mom, are you going to stop talking? You know, <laughs> he's also, you know, he, he had a little bit of that shyness, like, oh my gosh, mom, you know, but on the flip side, he's probably like, yep, that's my mom. You know what I mean? He would expect it anything less, you know, out of me. And I sometimes think in that weird way, like nobody wants this to happen to them. But I've told my husband, if it's going to happen, it would have happened to him because God knows my mouth won't be quiet. You know what I mean? And it is the way it is. I mean, I have days I don't want to go talk about it. It's hard or am I making a difference? But, you know, I still get up. I put my clothes on. I go out and I do it, you know, and then every time I do uh, something happens or someone says something that it's like, that is why I do that. You know what I mean? It's I a reminder. To, I was meant to meet that person today absolutely I was meant we to offer out. that person today so in our assemblies we have these bracelets we made and it says drugs end all dreams and it says family supporting families so we try to explain to the kids that you know not only when you make that choice you know um like I was saying to you earlier I tell my kids my daughter my son you know choices don't just affect you it affects your whole family and everybody around you, whether it be the good choices or the bad ones, but it's going to affect everybody. So when we talk to the students at um, our assemblies, we try to tell them, you know, drugs and all dreams. It ends the dream of the one who took it because their life is lost. Do you it give them the bracelets? We do. Yeah. And um, we, we explain how it, it, you know, ends the dreams of the parents because their life is forever changed of their brothers and sisters, their family. And it also, you know, ends the life of the person who gets caught selling to people because they're going to go to jail or prison. You never know. Yeah. And then it ends those families. So nobody wins. Everybody loses. There's no winner in, you know, trying to experiment with drugs, but, uh, we do give these out and, that led me to one of the stories. So my daughter works at a restaurant here in town and um, we had went to a, a large school in Sand Springs. They have like 1400 students and we spoke to that mm. school. Well, later on, some of the kids that go to that, that work, that go to that school work where my daughter does. So she showed up and she's all mom, there was like two kids that had your bracelets. And one other server was asking that kid about the bracelet and she's like, then before you know it, um, other kids were asking, what is that bracelet? And he was telling them, oh, these moms came and talked about their um, loved ones, you know, that had passed a fentanyl. So that message went to that school, but then everybody. So then Ella was like, hey, I think that's my mom and my brother and the bracelet because she had one. And so she showed him the bracelet. And he's like, oh, yeah, that was your mom. And I'm sorry about your brother. Well, she comes home and says, mom, could I have like five more bracelets? Cause other servers and hostesses want your bracelets. So, you know, it's just a ripple effect. You know what I mean? So oh, how it's nice. a good thing. Yeah. And just a confirmation of how much power you instilled in those kids to then speak about it to others. Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. that. That is such a great story, not to mention how heartwarming for you. <laughs> oh, yeah. There have been many instances with those bracelets. Like I've been out, I have spoken at my kid's school and the whole basketball team was wearing the bracelets. You know what I mean? And they still wear them. And it's oh. been months we spoke, like Red Ribbon Week. Red Ribbon Week's always a huge week for us out here. Like everybody wants us to come and speak, you know, 
Would, but, you, uh, would you tell our audience what Red Ribbon Week is? Yeah, that is the week at schools uh, where they teach the kids about drugs, illicit drugs, the dangers of drugs. Uh, I know at the school where my kids go, they'll do like different colored shirts or funny socks on each day, but they each represent something trying to remind the kids to not um, do drugs. Also um, on Red Ribbon Week, when we go, we take our kids' chairs. I don't know if you've heard about drug-induced homicide from Terror Bear, but they have an empty chair. So we take our kids' chairs and put them out there with their things. Um, like, so for example, my son has his shoes and his favorite shirt and, you know, his baseball glove and a couple of his favorite things. And we put it out there because the kids see the, these are happening to real people. Right. It's not just a story. Cole was real. You know what I mean? He had a real life. He had goals. He had things he wanted to do. You know, he had just signed up for the electrical union out here. He was going to adopt a dog when he moved out here. Like he had all these plans, you know, and just one bad choice and one fake pill was all it took. You know, I mean, and the pill Cole took, he thought it was a Percocet uh, or an M, an M30, the blue ones. Um, and it hadn't, the one that he took had enough fentanyl to kill three, three average adults. Um, that was what was in his system. So, you know, I wish he wouldn't, I know he wished he wouldn't have, but he definitely, I mean, as much as we did not con condone it, if he would have took what he thought he would still be here today. Fentanyl has changed everything, you know, has mm -hmm. changed. I mean, what do they say? I mean, in 2021, it was like four out of 10 pills had a lethal amount of fentanyl in them. Um, now it's seven out of 10. So it's just getting worse and worse. And now we even talk to kids about the zombie drug, you know, uh, xylazine, right. because they're putting that in that and in, in the drugs, lacing it in there. And Narcan, if you get a drug with that in there, Narcan will not save you. There is no second chance. It's just one and done, you know? So, and tell me what's about Narcan because um, we know what it is, but I want people listening. If this is oh. your first time listening about this, there is a drug that sometimes, although not always, that can be administered to you to save you after a lethal dose. So tell us. Um, more. Yeah, so it's medical name is naloxone, but everybody calls it Narcan. And um, in Oklahoma, you can get it mailed to you for free. Um, other states, it's a little bit more difficult, but um, I know now also you can purchase it um, over the counter um, in any state and also on Amazon, you can buy it. Um, but it is a nasal spray. So a box has two nasal sprays in it and there's only one spray in each nasal spray. So if someone is experiencing um, an opioid po poisoning, fentanyl exposure, anything like that, which I always want to mention, um, if you're unsure what that would look like if someone was exper you know, experiencing one of those opioid or fentanyl poisoning events, um, they get blue lips, they'll nod off, you won't be able to uh, wake them up, their breathing will get very shallow, their fingernails can start turning blue. And um, what fentanyl does is it literally makes you stop breathing. That's pretty much what, to sum it up. So naloxone or Narcan, which it's the same, it's this little nose spray that they have that you can spray it into one nostril. And then we always say call 911 first. Um, and then you spray it into one nostril, you do chest compressions uh, for three minutes. And then if they do not sit up and wake up or come start coming around, um, then you, use the, you open the other package and you use the other nose spray once don't spray it in the air because it'll, it only has a one shot in each nose spray. You spray it into the other nostril and then you can continue compressions until, um, emergency people show up. Don't leave your friends. Um, if you don't have Narcan call 911 and stay with them and do chest compressions. We don't tell people to do mouth to mouth because, um, you don't know what that person has ingested. If it was fentanyl and it happens to come from their spit into your mouth, you could start 
overdosing. So that's why we just say chest compressions. And then when they do come around, lean them to their side if they're laying flat, which they should be if you're doing all that correctly, because they can vomit. You don't want the vomit to get on you either. And you don't want them to choke on it. But a lot of times once you've, um, a person who's experiencing an opioid poisoning or fentanyl um, poisoning or episode, once you do that, they'll shoot right up. And um, they, it's like, they'll be laying there, you'll give them that and they'll sit right up. They're immediately brought out of that high. It blocks the receptors in their brain Amazing. from the op getting into it. So it's like bringing them from a high to like out of their high immediately. And they can be angry, you know, that's not a fun feeling. Um, but definitely, you know, they say majority of the deaths, people have had people with them and they haven't called and gotten them help or they've left them because they're afraid of getting in trouble and tell you what, you're going to get in a lot more trouble if you leave that person than if you stay there and try to get that person help. Mm -hmm. Um, so always stay with your friends. You know, there's been instances where kids have recorded it and put it on Snapchat or social media, watching this person dying and they have no idea. They think it's funny because they don't know, you know, they'll also sometimes make this loud snoring noise, which is usually their last breath, but you know, kids don't know. So we really, adults don't know that either, you know? So we really try to get that information out there. And let me just say, Narcan um, cannot hurt somebody. It can only save somebody's life. Uh, this no spray we're talking about. If you spray it in somebody, you're, let's say you're not sure if they're experiencing an opioid overdose, poisoning, whatever I call it poisoning, because a lot of people don't even know they've taken something that has fentanyl in it. Um, but if you use it, and let's say they're not experiencing um, an opioid crisis at the time or a fentanyl exposure, it's like spraying water up their nose. You won't hurt them. So essentially you can only help them. And then I also mentioned to people, don't think you can Narcan yourself because it usually doesn't work that way. Once you've taken a drug mm -hmm. that has fentanyl in it or an opioid in it, um, mostly the fentanyl, um, you will not have time. In Oklahoma, there's been several cases where the person has found a cease slaying on top of Narcan. So they thought they could shoot up, snort, ingest this drug. And if it were to happen to them, they'd have time to save themselves. But that's not how it works. So don't think that because I don't want people to be misled. Wow. You have given us a wealth of information, not to mention all of your personal history with this horrific opioid. I want our um, I want our listeners and our viewers to really take to heart the agony that one pill can cause all the rest of the people who love you. It's so important to understand that just once, once, or just a few little granules. Oh can, gosh. Can yeah. take your life. And sometimes it's in a pill form. And the problem is, is that there's no quality control here. The cartels that bring it in through Mexico, they just grab the fentanyl, grab the filler, and whatever goes in one pill doesn't go in another. They don't care. And yeah. That, and that's but, why sometimes you've got like friends who will do it together and one friend will not die and one friend will because nobody knows what's in each of these pills and nobody knows the ramifications. And even more so, we've got cocaine that mm -hmm. has fentanyl in it. We have... Um, marijuana that has it in it we've yeah. got her heroin that has it in it and people might have been using these products for years and never thought twice about it right Rebecca and now it just outright kills them with one dose Absolutely. We tell people any illicit drug, that means a drug that you're not being prescribed by a doctor to your name, or you haven't bought it from a sealed container in a store. 
you don't know what you're getting. Um, any illicit drug, anything you're getting off of, let's say a friend says, oh, well, I did it. Here you go. Take it. You don't know that friend's tolerance. You don't know what they've been taking. You don't know. Maybe they have had experience with opioids and whatever they give you, you never have. And it's just enough to take your life, but not theirs. Um, just to piggyback off of how you said people have taken partial pills or part of a drug and one person dies, the other one doesn't. We call that the chocolate chip cookie effect. Um, so like when you make a chocolate chip cookie, you don't put a chocolate chip, like you don't place them. You just throw them in and mix them up. So all your chocolate chips might be up here and none over here. So you're, let's say you're splitting a pill with another person and you get the corner that has all those chocolate chip or fentanyl, we're going to say you won't make it and your friend will. Um, another good thing I want to bring up is test strips. Not a full, in my opinion, not a foolproof way of um, staying alive. We push the Narcan over the test strips because what you have to do is whatever drug you're cho of choice that you're choosing to experiment or take that day, you have to crush it and dilute the entire thing because of that chocolate chip cookie effect. You can't just test part of your pill and think it's safe because this other part might have all the fentanyl. So you know, those test strips don't say that on there. And there's also over a hundred different analogs, meaning different chemicals that are coming over that can be used to create fentanyl. And not all of the analogs are detectable by test strips. No. So everybody needs to know that before they use them. I'm not against them. I just say, if you want to know 100%, the best way is don't do drugs. <laughs> don't <laughs> use a Yes, because you'd have to completely... Um you know, destroy the product to be able to test. Yeah. You'd have to drink it or shoot it, shoot it up. Those are your only options with something that's liquid. So, you know, I don't know. I, I just really try to impress, like, I hate everyone's like, oh, you can't tell people just say no. Well, we live in that time of the way fentanyl is and all these other different drugs that are coming out there. You almost have to just say no because it can and it will happen to you. When we take over 85 posters with us to all these different assemblies and events and their faces are out there, you think they all wanted to get high. They didn't think they were going to die, you know? Yes. So I know my son didn't. He would have never wanted to leave his mom or his family missing him like we, like we miss him, you know? I'm sure I always say the moment he realized he was gone, he thought, I always say he probably said, my mom, you know, oh my mom, oh my gosh, my mom, you know, he would have never wanted to leave, leave us here missing him like we do. I mean, it's horrible for our family. I cannot impress that on people enough. Like it's horrible. We'll never have him for, I mean, he just, this last December 19th, he would have been 21. That would have been, that was his 21st birthday. He wasn't here with us. We'll never have him for another birthday, another Christmas. I mean, Valentine's Day tomorrow, you go to buy what normally you get three cards or three candies, and I don't get to do that anymore. I have to buy two and then just sit there and think, gosh, I wish I still could buy three. The pictures of my kids, I'll never have all three of them together again. You know, it's just that it's a hole. It's a hole in your heart that can never be filled. That's very true. No, no parent wants and as much as maybe someone out there thinks nobody cares, oh, there's people that care about you. You will be missed. There will nobody be in your seat where you sit at the table or the bed you sleep in ever again. You are non-replaceable. There's only one of you in life. And we are all meant to live and do great things. Doing drugs is not going to lead to anything good, especially with fentanyl. So true. And unfortunately, so many who are gaining these pills are looking for one thing and they're getting the counterfeit and they have no idea. So they go on Snapchat and they order a Percocet or an oxycodone or a Xanax for anxiety or an Adderall. And they're thinking they're getting the right, what they asked for in the right dosage. Um, and little do they know that these dealers 
do not tell the truth. They oh, no. don't. They don't give you as many times as someone would say, are you sure that this is really what it is? Of course, the dealer is going to say, oh, yeah, it's fine. I know it's fine. Give me your money. And whatever happens to you is none of my business. Cool. Yeah, they're all about money. It's not yeah. about your life. They don't care. They can replace you with somebody else who wants to buy from them. They just want your money. They will tell you whatever is clever whatever you want to hear. And they will tell, I've seen on Cole's phone where they sit there and try to tell him, oh, you can take this together or take this mini or, oh, and I mean, Cole did ask, you know, one time a dealer, um, is it, I don't want anything fake, you know? So he probably knew a little bit about it more than I did. Kids know a lot more than us parents. And the dealer said, oh no, it's real. And he even showed him a prescription model, a, a photo of it. So you're 100% correct. You cannot trust a drug dealer. I mean, say that out loud. You know what I mean? And a drug dealer can be your friend. It can be the yes. friend sitting with you or your family member. You cannot trust them. You can't. And I mean, I'll even go so far out here in um, a town near us. A year and a half ago, there was a 12 year old boy who vaped off a vape pen and it took his life and it had oh. fentanyl in it. So, kids. I mean, we talk to kids and, you know, students, we have a return your vape box, no questions asked, and they can return anything in that. We get permission from the school. We do get vapes, but it's like, you don't know what's in it. And a lot of the vapes we're getting are ones that have been recalled. You can't even get them anymore. That means they're illicit. Someone has had these old vapes and are filling them with other things and giving them to you. You oh, don't even know. Goodness, I didn't it. know that. Wow. Yes. So every time we get a vape, I look it up and it'll say, oh, recall no longer being sold because it can be contaminated with. That means it's easy to be changed of what you're putting in it. So, I mean, it's scary, scary stuff. You know, we don't try to scare people, but it is scary. The education on it. If you're not a little bit nervous, you know, you got to sit back and think why, <laughs> because yes. as a parent, I'm worried about it for my kids, my other two, you know, it takes one, one bad day or one bad choice and man, it can change everything. As it did. Absolutely. As it did. And tell me about your other children. How are they dealing with everything? Um, well, it, it's very difficult, you know, um, they don't talk a lot about it. They do, but they don't like my son, when he talks about it, he'll cry about it. Um, my daughter, she, she's more of a doer. We have found, cause they went to, I took them to counseling to try to have at least the opportunity to talk about it. Um, and they did, they did counseling for a while, but you know, everybody deals with things differently. And I have, found that, you know, uh, my daughter's a doer. She doesn't sit still. She just keeps busy. You know, that's how she, she deals with it. You know, um, we don't have a choice. We have to, you know, they don't have a choice. We all, we're all in this together now. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yes. as a family, you just, I don't know, you pick up the pieces and you keep, you just have to keep moving forward, you know, yes. but I, I know my daughter, yeah. like, she wears the bracelet everywhere. So obviously that has touched her. You know what I mean? Yes. And they're not to go out. They don't go out and speak as much as I do. And, um, but that's okay because everybody deals with grief differently, you know, yes. but I know Cole is very missed. We, we talk about the good things about him and funny things we remember, you know, and or Cole would have liked that, you know, it's just, when it hits your brain, you, you share it. And we all do talk about him. I try to mention his name every day, whether it be just say it out loud, you know, because I do believe in my belief, like he's in heaven and we can't see him, but he's, he's here with us. You know, where else would he rather be than with his family? Right. So. Rebecca, I've really enjoyed our conversation and I thank you so much. For Absolutely. taking the time to tell us your story, Cole's life and death, unfortunately, and all that you've gone through as a family to just keep moving forward and your, 
your victim advocacy, your work, just phenomenal. Thank you. I appreciate you letting us come or letting me come and speak and share about Cole. And I hope there's something I said that maybe helps other families. I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. So to my listeners and viewers, I want to thank you for being here. Please subscribe, rate, review, and comment wherever you hear us or see us. And that's so important so that we will push through and increase ourselves in the algorithms. And this way, more people will be able to see what we've what we've learned, see what uh, Rebecca has shared with us today, and also listen to what she shared with us today. So God bless you, Rebecca. Thank you again for everything. And I'll be uh, with you in the next episode. Good night now.